Just waiting for the last one to get in. Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our uh, Grand Rounds, the last one for the year. Um, today we have Dr. Claire Sandu uh, joining us. She is an assistant professor of medicine for neurology at the University of Toronto. She completed her medical degree and master's of neuroscience at McGill University. Her neurology residency at the University of Toronto and a fellowship in headache medicine at the University of Toronto as well. Under the supervision of Dr. Christine Lay, she serves as an education serves on the education committees of the International Headache Society and the American Headache Society, and is the co-chair of the Canadian Headache Society National Neurology Resident Headache Course and the American Headache Society's Master Mastering Migraine Therapies Program. Welcome. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here with everybody today. I'm just going to get my screen up. Um, are you able to see my screen adequately? Perfect, okay. Um, so my name is indeed Claire Sando. I am indeed from Toronto, um, and I am looking forward to talking to you about hormones and headaches. I'm going to give some sort of background in general about headaches before we delve into the hormone-specific part, and you Just are welcome to try to put questions. Walk around. Walk around. In, there's just some background noise. We're going to, um, you're welcome to put questions in the chat as we go. If you'd like, I'll do my best to monitor it, and then I'll try to leave a question and answer 10 minutes at the end as well. And I have some disclosures that are relevant to tell you about. Uh, for our objectives today, we're going to start by trying to understand the clinical features and diagnostic criteria of migraine and what is not migraine, how to formulate a multimodal treatment plan for somebody who has migraine, and then describe impact of hormones on migraine, specifically focusing on the perimenopause period. And we're hopefully going to clear some of this mist by the end of the talk. So why does headache need its own brand rounds? Headache is one of the most common human experiences. If you ask a room full of people if they've had a headache, just about everybody there knows what it is to have some type of headache at some time. And one in seven people in the world, which is more than a billion, have migraine. It is the third most prevalent disorder in the world after anemia and hearing loss, and is the second leading cause of years lived with disability worldwide. In Canada, it's quite prevalent. 2.7 people report being diagnosed, and this is probably an underestimate because many people are not diagnosed. Headache itself can be uh, a sign of something that could potentially maim or kill you, something secondary, or it could be a primary headache disorder that is potentially quite disabling but does not maim or kill you. So it's important to think of as a symptom. And so why hormones and headaches here? Uh, headache is more prevalent in women, and the lifetime prevalence for any headache disorder in women is over 70% and hovering at 65% for men. And again, the lifetime prevalence of migraine is higher in women than men. It's somewhere between two and three times higher in women than men. Um, we, as we will discuss in some detail, headache disorders often change when hormones are changing and we have to modify our treatments in some of the different life stages, for example, pregnancy, menopause, and so we are going to anchor all of our thinking around a couple of sort of thinking cases. So we're going to start with Jolene, who's 25, and tells you since she was 12, she's had two to four days of headache each month. Sometimes she's had to miss school because of these. Actually, she had to leave a wedding early because one of them. And she tells you it is bilateral tension in the forehead. And initially she says she doesn't have light or sound sensitivity. She doesn't vomit. So on the face of it, is this tension type headache? So when seeing anybody who has a headache disorder, the first job is to try to figure out whether they have a primary versus a secondary headache. So primary, something you're probably born susceptible to versus secondary, the headache indicates something else is going on. Like maybe you have a brain tumor, something that could be truly deadly. And to do this, we start with a detailed history and exam looking for so-called red flags, which I'll go over in just a second. If there are red flags, we need to think about what kind of secondary headache could be going on. If there are no red flags, they probably have a primary headache disorder, such as migraine. But if there's something weird that comes up, we probably need to reevaluate. And so these red flags we often think of with the mnemonic SNOOP. And so S is for systemic or secondary, whether you have fever or you have a risk factor, such as you have cancer, that might make you more likely to have something secondary going on. 
and is for neurologic, whether that's altered level of awareness or weakness or what have you. The first O is for onset. So a headache that starts and becomes its worst within 60 seconds is a so-called thunderclap headache that's often worrisome for something like an artery problem, such as an aneurysm. The second O is for older. So it's less likely to have <clears throat> a new primary headache start when you're older and you're at higher risk of some other worrisome things when you're over 50. There are some Ps, uh, various Ps. The ones that I like to remember are previous. So if you used to have one headache a year and now you have daily headache, that's a big change from previous. Maybe that's worrisome. Precipitated. So if coughing or Valsalva brings on a headache, maybe that's there's a raised pressure problem. And then positional, whether that's worse upright or worse flat again, could suggest a pressure problem. Like maybe you have high pressure in the brain or maybe you have low pressure because of a CSF leak. So we ask about all of these things and trying to figure out where the patient fits. And the diagnostic criteria for migraine as per our International Classification of Headache Disorders, ICHD3, you have repeated attacks, lasting at, at least five of them, lasting four to 72 hours without treatment. Uh, just to note, that is an untreated duration. If somebody has a migraine attack, they take a medication, it goes away in an hour, that doesn't mean it wasn't a migraine attack. So we have to ask about the duration without a treatment. And there's this two plus one equals migraine rule that can be helpful when asking people and trying to figure out whether they may have migraine. So any two of the headache is one-sided, throbbing, worse with activity, moderate to severe, and one of nausea or vomiting, or sensitivity to both light and sound. And so you'll note that somebody could have a bilateral pressure feeling headache that could still be in keeping with migraine if it got worse with activity, was bothersome, and had some of these sensitivities. And maybe up to a quarter of migraine attacks have an aura before them. We'll come back to aura a bit later because it's quite relevant to the hormone piece. So when seeing somebody with headache in terms of whether they need tests, the idea is that if there's a red flag, you probably need to image them. If not, probably don't. But if they're coming back and returning, maybe thinking about this is worthwhile. And in terms of what to do, CT head is very appropriate if it's something acute, like trauma, or you think they have a stroke, but otherwise it doesn't assess the parenchyma very well. And so MRI is usually the right answer if you think that somebody needs imaging for a headache. Just some rules of thumb to keep in mind for diagnosis. People who come to medical attention for headache have migraine about 80% of the time. So it's most of what ends up happening. If there is sensitivity to smell or osmophobia, most likely migraine. If it gets worse with activity, it's most likely migraine. Tension type headache is usually not truly disabling and is often potentially misdiagnosed. If people are sensitive to both light and sound, it's not tension type headache by definition, and it's probably more in a migraine realm. True sinus headaches are rare. Migraine itself can give you pain anywhere in your face, head, neck, the location is not as important as the features and the other things like the sensitivities to the environment that come. So when asking people about headaches, sometimes people only want to tell you about what's bothering them now. And they may you may end up in a place where people will, oh, it's normal headaches. You hear this all the time. I heard this from somebody this morning. Normal headaches, yes, taking my ibuprofen three days a week for headaches, isn't that normal? And that is not actually normal. Um, so it's good to have details about any and all headaches the person has had in the past, even if they were not really bothersome. This also gets to some of our red flags. So somebody who has had so-called normal headaches for years and they're just getting worse is probably less worrisome to you than somebody who has truly new disabling headaches. Language is also important. Sometimes people will use words in ways that are unexpected. So I've had people tell me, I don't have headache. Okay, so... I have face pain and they are using the word face pain and they don't think you mean headache and you end up in a, in a confused place. So it's good to be sure that you and the patient are uh, understanding each other about some of these words. And to try to understand whether some of those migraine features like sensitivity to light or sound are present, asking about behavior can be really helpful. So people will say, like that case patient I gave to start, no, I don't have light sensitivity. No, I don't have sound sensitivity. People think that that should mean that headache goes away entirely in the dark. However, if you ask what they do and they say, oh, of course I'd rather be in the dark and turn off the light, then you can infer from behavior that they actually do have those migraineous features. And so back to our case, actually, Jolene does think she would rather lie down in a dark, quiet place, doesn't want to eat. 
which can be a sub sort of uh, indication of nausea. Most of the attacks are sort of a yellow level slowing her down. She doesn't pay much attention to them until they get to be severe. And she also tells you that her meds work, except she also missed a wedding. So we're still in a little bit of a confused place, but we think that she has migraine. And migraine itself is a brain disorder. And this is just a sort of picture of some of the uh, large views of some of the pathways and the chemicals that are important, which are relevant to a lot of our thinking and medications. So we think that when you have a migraine attack, it starts inside your brain in the hypothalamus, which sends some signals down into your brainstem, which relays stuff out, some pain fibers, where there are some important chemicals like uh, serotonin and CGRP involved. The signals come back up to your brain and your brain tells you that you feel pain. So this is a brain problem. And during a migraine attack, there are often a lot of different phases. As the attack is starting, when your hypothalamus turns on, there can be a lot of things like yawning, craving food, feeling uh, fuzzy cognitively. This can last even up to a couple of days for some people. Sometimes there's an aura, which again we'll talk a bit about later. The headache itself can last up to three days. And then there can be this sort of hangover postrome that can last also one to two days where people can feel high or low, have still fogginess, fatigue. So if you add up the entire duration, if somebody had a long prodrome attack, postrome, it could actually be a week start to finish for one migraine attack. And so the headache duration itself does not necessarily indicate how bothersome everything that's going on is to a given person. And we classify migraine again using our criteria is either episodic, where you have less than half the month with headache, or chronic, where you have half the month or more with headache. And there are some risk factors for migraine getting worse. So having more headache days per month, uh, medication overuse, things like sleep disruption, um, unfortunately, some things like low socioeconomic status or being female are risk factors, as well as stressful things happening to you and adverse childhood experience. It's a little bit of a fuzzy line, and some people fluctuate a little bit up and down, and you can still be very bothered by migraine even if you don't have more than half the month with headache, but we still use these criteria for now. So when trying to manage somebody who has migraine, we start by having a look at, is there something else going on that could be making them worse? So do they have sleep apnea? Are they iron deficient, which is something that can contribute to chronic pain in general? Is there anemia or vitamin D deficiency? Is there bruxism? There are a lot of people with migraine who have bruxism. And then we pull together a number of different things to try to make a good uh, treatment for somebody who has migraine. This often includes lifestyle strategies, some behavioral things, vitamins, acute treatment prevention. Not everyone needs every element of this, but we're often much more able to, to find a, an effective multimodal treatment than doing just one of these things at a time. And we're going to go over these things just so you have a framework for when we talk specifically about the hormones. So from the lifestyle perspective, there's often this big idea about migraine attack triggers. And the what I tell my patients is that people who have migraine, their brains do not like change, whether that is internal or external, and that can trigger attacks. So that could be something like sleep disruption, skipping a meal, hormone changes are a huge one, which we'll talk through in lots of detail. External things like weather change. So all of my patients did extremely poorly this month with the heat waves that we had down here in Toronto and a bunch of thunderstorms. Um, and so it's this surprisal element, the change that your brain sees that is this trigger. And often what happens is these triggers add up. And so you're much more likely to have a bad attack if you have multiple triggers on a given day than if you had just one. However, some things that we used to think of as triggers may actually not be triggers. So uh, when your hypothalamus turns on to give you a migraine attack, sometimes there are food cravings. So people may crave chocolate and eat it, have a migraine attack, and think that they did it to themselves by eating the chocolate when actually they were told by their brain that they wanted the chocolate in the first place because the migraine attack had already started. So some of these things, it's not a false situation. Some of these are just migraine-related issues. Other lifestyle things to think about are trying to uh, keep all of those changes in as good check as possible, so consistent sleep, um, good sleep hygiene. One of the things that my patients most commonly come back and tell me they think is the most helpful lifestyle thing they do is having breakfast with a good amount of protein within an hour of getting up. 
And this also can feed into the sleep routine. If people are sleeping in by a couple of hours on a weekend, then their breakfast is also late. And that's a couple of different potential weekend triggers. So weekend attacks are something that people sometimes will report. And we can try to manage with some of these lifestyle changes. Staying hydrated, not having too much caffeine. Your brain has caffeine receptors. And the threshold varies person to person. But this is kind of a rough suggestion. Exercise and green space, uh, increasingly thought to be very helpful as well as keeping a diary. So actually understanding how often and how severe things are, seeing if there are any clear relationships between uh, what you're doing and whether you have a headache and whether your medications work. The behavioral strategies there can actually be quite helpful. So mindfulness or meditation. Um, if people have insomnia, cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia can be helpful. Otherwise, CBT in general has pretty good studies for migraine. Progressive muscle relaxation, biofeedback um, has reasonable evidence for migraine too, but can be quite difficult to access. And in fact, I'm not even sure where to do so in Toronto. I've heard some of my patients in non-Toronto locations are using this with good benefit though. From the vitamin perspective, these are the things that we have some evidence for in preventing migraine. And the uh, patients sometimes come back and think that they must be deficient. It's not deficient. It's as though you were using a prevention medication. It's just you're using an extra vitamin. Um, and so these are things like vitamin B2, which is riboflavin. Magnesium, if given at night, sometimes even helps with sleep. Coenzyme Q10. We're starting to think that vitamin D may be helpful. And then there are some studies for melatonin, not as a sleep aid, but actually for migraine prevention. As you may know, the supplement industry is not as regulated as medication. So trying to get a version that is independently verified is an important thing to suggest people do. And then we get to the acute treatment piece. So this is the American Headache Society's consensus statement about what we want our treatments to do. So the goals are that you are rapidly and consistently free of both pain and the other symptoms of migraine without them coming back, Restored ability to function, so you can go back to your day, not needing to repeat or use rescue medications much, not needing to go to the ER, not having bad side effects, and then not too costly. And so I would just highlight that our patient who told us that ibuprofen worked but was still missing activities and still getting to severe place, this is not meeting the goals that we have for our patients. And the idea is that if you're able to get the acute treatments in as quickly as possible, they're much more likely to work. And that's within an hour of the attack starting for the most part. It's more likely to work. And some studies suggest that it's, you're less likely to have side effects if treating early as well. So the acute medications that we use include things like triptan, of which there are seven. And they come in different versions, pills, nasal sprays, injection. There are two acute G-pants approved now, ubrochpant and rimagepant. We have a variety of anti-inflammatory NSAID medications. There are some antimedics, some neuromodulatory devices. So the external trigeminal nerve stimulator that I've got a picture of on the right, there are two versions of that available in Canada. There's a vagus nerve stimulator too. We don't like using combination analgesics or things with opioids or butalbital because there is this concern about medication overuse headache, which we used to call rebound headache. This we define as you have headache at least half the month in the context of taking acute medications too much for at least three months. And what is too much is a little different medication to medication, but it adds up between the different months. So for tryptans, taking these more than kind of 10 days a month puts you at risk. Simple analgesics like acetaminophen is about 15 days. Combo is less. And then opioids as little as three days a month can potentially increase your risk for this. And these are not, again, hard and fast cut off. There's probably some variability person to person, but this is something that can really perpetuate a headache in a number of people. So if you took your acetaminophen 10 days and your tryptan 10 different days, that's 20 days rather than 10 days. Uh, just to note, these G-pants that I mentioned, we don't think cause medication overuse. We also don't think that long-acting anti-inflammatories like naproxen do. So we're just going to talk through some treatment considerations around Jolene before moving to the hormone dedicated part. So Jolene, a bit older, she's 27, and she says she has visual aura lasting 45 minutes every few months. She's taking Sertraline for anxiety. She wants to know whether she can take a tryptan. And so 
uh, in this virtual format, I'm going to, uh, you're welcome to raise your hand, put things in the chat, but I'm also just going to leave this, these as thinking pieces, and then we'll talk through what I think the, the more correct answer would be. So what can we tell her about triptan? So options are A, given auras, triptans are not recommended. B, given sertraline, triptans are not recommended. C, triptans are best studied for use at headache onset, not at the aura. Or D, triptans are only recommended for very severe pecs. So I would like to argue that it's actually option C, triptans are best studied for use at headache rather than at aura. And we'll talk through why for all of these potentials. So for triptans, they're not contraindicated in people who have a typical type of aura. And we don't really think that they carry a serotonin syndrome risk in uh, conjunction with SSRIs anymore. Most of the contraindications relate to concerns about what would happen if they constricted your blood vessels, which we know they do, but in clinical practice, we don't really see clear evidence of harm. However, we're still extra cautious not to give our patients heart attacks. So we avoid them in people who have things like cardiovascular disease or have had a stroke, people who have uncontrolled blood pressure, um, unusual auras, like very long aura, people who are older, Triptans are not as studied, and they may have more vascular risk factors, so we're cautious. And then in pregnancy, we are potentially cautious as well. And in terms of how to approach what kind of treatment to use, this is something developed by our group at Women's College. So the concept is that people will use different numbers on the pain scale to mean very different things. And to try to really understand the impact of a migraine attack, understanding more than just the pain is important. So we ask about function. And so a green level of headache is you can still go. Yellow is you're slowed down. And red is you have to stop. And so for a milder attack, you might not need to treat as aggressively as one of these more severe. So for a severe attack, you might actually need to combine multiple types of medications, whether that's a tryptan and an NSAID, or potentially something like a GPANT and an NSAID, versus you might only need an NSAID for a mild attack or no treatment. In terms of where to position what treatment, because we have so many options, um, somebody who has a fast attack, maybe they need a fast medication like an injection or a nasal spray. If there's a lot of nausea or vomiting, they might need something that doesn't have to go through the stomach, uh, such as, again, an injection, or maybe they need a specific nausea treatment. We'll talk about the menstrually related stuff in some detail in a minute. Um, extra magnesium when you start to have an aura sometimes can help turn off the aura. And among the tryptan family, the one that in studies has the lowest side effect rate is almotryptan. So worth trying for people who have lots of side effects. And then people who have cardiovascular disease, you might end up in the aspirin or GPANT realm. So back to Jolene, who, as we remember, has her visual aura last 45 minutes every few months. She's getting worse. She has six to eight migraine days per month now. So should you think about a preventive and if so, which one? And options here are she doesn't need prevention. She doesn't have chronic migraine. Option B, a beta blocker is a good first option. Option C, candesartan is a good first option. Or option D, on a botulinum toxin A is a good first option. And so my suggestion to you is that option C, candesartan is a good first option, would be my preferred answer to this. So the reasons to think about prevention are if people have four or more headache days a month. That doesn't sound like many, but that in studies was the risk threshold for getting worse and transforming into chronic migraine. And other reasons are if you have disabling attacks despite your acute treatment. So somebody who has hemiplegic migraine and every time they have a migraine attack goes to the ER and gets PPA as though they had a stroke, that even very few attacks might be disabling enough to think about prevention, even if they don't have one a month. Or if people can't use acute treatments or have too many side effects or they just don't work, it's still worth thinking. And that doesn't mean that everybody has to have one, but it's worth thinking about and discussing with the person. And our goal is usually that people get at least half better in terms of how often and how severe their attacks are. But if somebody has daily pain, it may be more realistic to try to reduce severity rather than people pain free or even 50% fewer headache days. And usually we start low, we go slow, we think about the person in front of us when choosing and not just about the names on the guidelines. Um, and if for a given person a side effect would be dangerous, then we probably wouldn't choose that medication. So somebody who has glaucoma or is at really high risk of ankle closure, you might not choose to pyramate 
And there used to be this idea that dual benefit was a great thing and that we should pick one medication for two things whenever possible, but that can actually lead to under treating both conditions. So for example, as I'll talk about in a minute, many of our migraine medications are borrowed from things like mood, but they may not be great mood agents. And we may use much lower doses for migraine than we would if we were doing it for mood. And so you may end up with poorly controlled migraine and poorly controlled mood versus picking a really good migraine treatment and a really good mood agent could actually be a better result for the patient. So among our oral preventives, and I will just say that there are new preventive guidelines in press. I'm sorry I don't have them to share with you today. They're literally in press. I think they'll be available in the CJNS hopefully in the next month. But the things that we use are borrowed usually from other categories like blood pressure, which includes candesartan, has quite good evidence, and some of the beta blockers, some of the anti-epileptics like topiramate, the mood family medications, there's one GPAN to TOGPAN, and then there are some other things that we sometimes use. Uh, in specific cases, you might avoid certain things. So beta blockers are thought to potentially worsen aura. And so that's why I didn't feel that they were the right first choice for this patient case we talked about. Tricyclic antidepressants, so anything with anticholinergic potential like amitriptyline, has been reported associated with long-term risk of dementia when used in older patients and long-term. And so it's not necessarily my first choice. It's also worth avoiding other stuff that might make headache worse like amlodipine. And if somebody needs a blood pressure medication, if they can, then one of those potentially migraine helpful ones could be a better choice. Other non-oral things, we've got onobotulinum toxin A for chronic migraine. There are four CGRP monoclonal antibodies. There's neuromodulation, like those ones we have for acute treatment, and sometimes things like nerve blocks, for example, people who might be pregnant or lactating. So Jolene, put her on candesartan, eight milligrams a day four weeks ago, and she calls and says, it's not working, but when she tried to go higher, she was lightheaded. What can we tell her? So options are she should stop it, it is not working. Or if she can't take 16 milligrams a day, she should just stop. It can take two to three months to assess the efficacy, so she should continue. Or she should add in something else, like pyramid. And so this is just getting to our treatment goals. It can take two to three months at a reasonable dose to assess how things are going. Um, and this is unfortunately quite long. And it is sometimes even on the three months end at a reasonable dose. For the monoclonal antibodies, it's longer, up to six months. And then for onobotulinum toxin A, it's three rounds or nine months. So this is very slow, which is important for your patients to know at onset. And in terms of whether to how to manage things once people are on them, if it isn't working or the side effects are intolerable, stop. If it's working a little bit, but you can't go higher, um, then maybe adding something in is worthwhile rather than losing the benefit of the first one. But if things are going well, then often we'll continue until people are well for maybe six to 12 months and then potentially try to help them stop these preventives. But if they get worse when you're trying to take them off, then maybe staying at the lowest dose that is helpful is worthwhile. Okay, so we are going to talk uh, tons about hormones for the rest of this time. And we've already mentioned that changes are extremely impactful for migraine. And so there are lots of hormone changes that are worth keeping in mind. So there's menarche, there are menstrual periods, it might, might be pregnancy, lactation, contraceptives, menopause, hormone replacement, all of these things are really important for both migraine itself and some of our treatments. I'm not going to talk from a hormone perspective about gender affirming hormone therapy today just for time constraints, um, just so you know. So we're just going to talk quickly through all of the up to menopause part because I think it's important to understand what's happening and why with hormones, even to understand the menopause part as well. So this is a different person who we're going to follow through her lifespan. So Rena, uh, who's 13 currently, she had her first menstrual period earlier this year, and she had a very bad headache after she stayed up really late studying for an exam. She actually left the exam to vomit and then slept it off and felt better. So is this just a stress headache in the context of the exam? So from a migraine perspective, migraine in boys is more common until around age seven and then it's about equal from eight to 11. And then once girls go through puberty, migraine prevalence rises and remains higher over the rest of the lifespan. And very probably, given this age and the disabling nature of this touch, probably is going to have migraine. So what about periods now that she's started to have them? So she's 19 
and she's starting to have headache a day, one day before her periods, and is actually missing class because of these. There is some nausea and photophobia during the attack. So why is she having these attacks around her period? And the options are the progesterone drop before the period triggers them, the estrogen drop before the period triggers them. Stress is probably the most likely cause, or genetics are the most likely cause. And although there is an element potentially of stress and genetics, really we think that it's the estrogen drop before menstruation that is triggering the attacks. And so this is what we would call menstrually related migraine. So attacks that are occurring around a period within a couple of days of it starting at least two thirds of the time. And you'll see outlines the hormone changes over the cycle. There's this estrogen drop as you are about to have a period. And it's that change again that we think that's the trigger for these attacks. Sometimes uh, women also have an ovulatory attack, probably also in the context of some estrogen drops around that time. And these attacks are often worse in severity and worse in terms of not being as responsive to treatment. And more often they're attacks without aura. So these attacks can actually drive the overall frequency. Sometimes people will end up in a place where they have headache every day during their period. They've got three days, five days, something like this. And so that's putting them at the risk threshold of getting worse in general. And so for people who have a predictable cycle and, and predictably know that one day before their period, they're going to get the terrible headache, you might actually do something just to try to prevent only those attacks. And even if there is headache at other times in the month, there's been research to suggest that if you improve just the period part, you might actually make all of the migraine part better. So it's worth thinking about even in people who have headache at other times of the month. We do still do normal migraine things, and there were some specific studies for menstrually related migraine for this combo pill of Zumatrixin and naproxen, as well as Ubroge pant. But otherwise, whatever acute treatment people want to use can be fine. It just may not work as well during this time period. So for the mini prevention strategies, we time these to the headache, which can vary relative to the period from person to person. So that may not be the first day of bleeding. It may be two days before or two days after. And so one day before you think that headache is going to start, people start taking this targeted mini prevention. We have a couple of options. So maybe a long-acting anti-inflammatory like naproxen twice a day for five to seven days. We also sometimes use others like nebumatone or mefenamic acid. These can sometimes help the period cramps too, if that's something people have. Some of the long-acting tryptans like narotryptan or frovitryptan taken twice a day could be helpful around this time period too. But it's important to note that here, the number of days you're using them counts towards your month total in terms of avoiding medication overuse. So this can be tough. And sometimes I would use one of the NSAID ones first uh, to give people still access to more tryptan days. We're not sure about the g -pants yet. There's some anecdotal evidence about a couple of these. Um, we don't think they have medication overuse risk, but the studies are not uh, fully performed in this area yet. So non-medication stuff, so things that might minimize periods. The less often you have that estrogen drop, the less you're going to have a mentally related attack. And so sometimes things like a continuous oral contraceptive, always if it's health appropriate, or a progesterone IUD, if that minimizes periods, can be uh, potential options. And so some people will use the three months in a row pills and then have a period or take them all the time. Um, or my patients who have their progesterone IUDs and don't have periods at all sometimes find that helpful. There's also a bit of evidence for taking magnesium from when you ovulate until your period starts just to prevent the migraine part. And then there are some studies about adding back estrogen with a patch. Um, however, studies do suggest that once you take the patch off again, the attack will probably start because then you're withdrawing estrogen and it's the same potential trigger as during the period, you've just delayed it. So that one is not our necessarily preferred option because it doesn't really prevent, it may just delay these attacks. Okay, so pregnancy and lactation, we're gonna touch on these just briefly. So Rena, now 23, she's pregnant at eight weeks, wants to know what to expect migraine waves in pregnancy. So Options are migraines not usually impacted by pregnancy, migraines usually worse in pregnancy, or migraine usually improves in pregnancy. And fortunately, migraine typically does improve during pregnancy. I'll, we'll talk about why. So the course in the first trimester is pretty variable because there are more hormone fluctuations during this time. And so it can be tough. However, 
once people get into the second trimester, as estrogen rises and remains more stable for the rest of the pregnancy, things often go really well. And somewhere between 50 and 80% of people who have migraine get better. And some actually come back and say, that was the best migraine time of my life when I was pregnant. Um, it's not necessarily a great migraine prevention strategy, though it's not very long-term sustainable. So in second and third trimester, things are often quite good. This improvement is more common in people who have menstrually related migraine and so who have that clear relationship between the hormone piece and the migraine attack piece. It's also more likely if you do not have aura that you'll be better in pregnancy. And sometimes there are people who have new auras in pregnancy. This probably is because estrogen is rising and estrogen is also related to aura. Um, migraine itself is actually a risk factor for some pregnancy issues like preeclampsia, reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome, which is those just worth keeping in the back of your mind if somebody who has migraine comes in with something that looks really different while they're pregnant. Okay, so Rena has been doing really well. She's 35 weeks pregnant. She didn't have any migraine attacks since 12 weeks of pregnancy. So she's thinking about whether to breastfeed or not. What can you tell her about this? So options here are no migraine treatments are safe in lactation or she will likely remain headache-free postpartum. Lactation can worsen migraine, or migraine may worsen when periods resume. So migraine may worsen, unfortunately, when periods resume, but fortunately, the other things are not typically the case. So especially before periods come back, lactation can be protective for migraine. You're reducing the number of times you have those hormone changes. And so again, this can be a good time, although, right after the, uh, around the peri and postpartum period, this can be challenging because this is another one of those times when there's a big hormone change, estrogen drops. And so sometimes people have a pretty bad peripartum postpartum attack. Um, we're not gonna talk specifically about uh, treatment in pregnancy or lactation, but I'm happy to chat about that later at the end if that's something that's of interest. The talk was just getting way too long when I had that in here. Okay, so Rena's now 10 months postpartum and she's been getting a bit worse over the last two months. She's up to 12 migraine days per month. She's breastfeeding. She might want to get pregnant again next couple of years. She wants to know if she should take one of these new CGRP targeted therapies that she saw on American TV when she was on vacation, which is something that we hear a lot. So options here are uh, Ubrotopant, a good option in lactation. Atojopant is a good option in lactation. CGRP monoclonal antibody is a good option in lactation or an oral agent would usually be tried before a CGRP targeted option. And because it's the only most different option, an oral agent would usually be tried before a CGRP targeted option. Just specifically thinking about these newer treatments in women, for the antibodies, they have a very long half-life. It's about a month, which means that it takes five to six months for them to be totally out of your system. And we do not fully understand the potential impact of these treatments on pregnancy. There are registries uh, with a couple of cases, but so far we don't know. CGRP itself is important for the development of the placenta. So even if it's not going through the placenta into the fetus, we're not sure about the impact on placentation. And then CGRP is really important for things like bone, immune system, blood vessel, brain development. So typically we recommend stopping these at least five to six months before trying for pregnancy. And then in breastfeeding, they're not really studied and not recommended for now. Again, we don't really understand how much crosses through breast milk, but because of how important CGRP is for ongoing development, it's a concern. For the G-pants, in pregnancy, they're not recommended. Again, CGRP is important. Uh, because they have a shorter half-life, the conservative recommendation is to stop two weeks before trying for pregnancy. So that may give a little bit of a closer window for some people. In lactation, they're also not recommended. There was one study for Romegepant that the level was low. So in the US, some people are using this, but again, this is not well studied and certainly not an on-label indication for now. Okay, so contraceptives. Rena, no longer pregnant. She's having a scintillating scotoma, visual aura, 45 minutes every few months. She doesn't smoke, she's healthy. What can you tell her about hormonal contraception? I think this is a really important one. We get lots and lots of referrals and uh, patient concerns about this. So options are high dose estrogen pills, so 50 to 100 micrograms a day is the best option to reduce migraine attacks. Low dose estrogen, 20 micrograms a day or less 
could be considered with caution. Progesterone-only strategies are the only hormonal option for her, or neither estrogen nor progesterone are safe given her auras. And all of these things are things that I've heard from different people in the past. So I will argue that it is low-dose estrogen could be considered with caution. So when you have an aura, what we think is happening in your brain is there is a wave of cortical spreading depolarization that starts most commonly in the visual uh, occipital lobe, and it starts and spreads where the wave is, things are excited, and there is a bit more uh, brain activity, and there's a bit more blood flow, and there can be these so-called positive symptoms, extra stuff, sparkles, sparkles, tingles if it's a sensory aura, where the wave has passed. Things are a bit depressed. There is a bit less activity and less blood flow. And so there are negative symptoms. There's less of vision, so loss of vision or loss of feeling. And this thing often gives this uh, positive symptoms followed by negative symptoms. Patients will sometimes tell you, I see it walk across the world, which is sort of what this picture is showing. There's that leading edge of the color sparkle bit followed by some, there's not quite as much vision in the area. Or they'll tell you, I feel it walk up my hand into my face. And because of the way that this is working in your brain, usually it starts slowly, spreads slowly, lasts five to 60 minutes. The kinds of symptoms that are typical are vision, like we said, colors, sparkles, losing vision, sensory, numbness, prickles, tingles, and speech, which is true language dysfunction. So what you say comes out nonsense, or you really cannot understand things. Anything else is not typical. So motor weakness is not typical. Diplopia, not typical. And you'll also note that I didn't mention things like blurred vision, which is often just something that happens as part of migraine and is not usually an aura. So from an aura hormone perspective, people who have migraine in general, have a two times higher risk of ischemic stroke and one and a half times higher risk of hemorrhagic stroke. But this risk is mostly driven by migraine with aura rather than people who don't have aura. The risk is higher in people who don't have other risk factors like they're under 45, as well as people who smoke. And the studies that we used to base our thinking on used the old uh, combined hormonal contraceptives, the ones with 50 to 100 micrograms a day, and said that there was an increased stroke risk when using those in people with migraine with aura. But more recently, when they looked back, they said, yes, we agree, but the lower doses really haven't been studied as well, and the risk is unclear. And we think that how risky, you, how risky your risk is relative to aura depends on what your aura is like. So if you have aura more often, which is more than once a month, or if it's longer, so it's longer than an hour, or you have really severe symptoms, like you completely lose vision, that's not typical. Um, and that means that you're in that place where your brain activity and blood flow is depressed for longer, you're probably at higher risk than somebody who has a shorter aura or less severe or it's less common. Pregnancy has health risks, although it's not a disease, and it's not necessarily benign to not have uh, access to reliable contraception for everybody. So some of our newer estrogen combined pills may be safe in people with aura if the auras are not frequent and not prolonged. There was a study where they used the estrogen ring that got rid of the menstrually related attacks and auras improved. And so there was an extrapolatory thought that maybe stroke risk was reduced, but this is really controversial. We don't actually have a conclusion about that. My conclusions though are that if you don't have aura, the combined pills are probably fine, but you probably want to avoid changes. So non-cycling or low dose pills so that the drop in estrogen in your pill-free week is lower. And you wanna keep an eye out for new auras. If you do have aura, the progesterone options are probably the safest, but if you really need estrogen for other health reasons, which sometimes people do have very big benefits from, but you don't have any of those high risk features, considering something that's low dose with caution, so that's 20 micrograms a day or less, is reasonable to think about with really careful monitoring for changes in auras or headaches. Okay, so the menopause and hormone replacement part, now that you fully understand everything about hormones and why things are impactful when women get to the stage. So Rena's 55, she's having hot flashes, her periods are irregular, and she used to have two migraine days a month, now she has 14. Is this normal and does she need hormone replacement? So options are she needs an urgent MRI given this pattern change probably just stressed about menopause. Hormone fluctuations of menopause can worsen migraine, or hormone replacement is contraindicated given her migraine history. And based on what we've said so far, this change, hormone fluctuations of menopause can worsen migraine is very strongly the case. 
So we know from Rena's test with the mentally related attacks and the pregnancy and all the all of what's happened to her that she has a strong hormone influence on her migraine attacks. So it's probably not unexpected that this time when hormones are fluctuating so much is going to be difficult. And again, you'll remember that migraine brains just don't like change at all. And so in addition to the hormone changes, there's often sleep disruption related to things like hot flashes, which she seems to be having. Um, it's also worth keeping in mind, the menopausal transition can be very long, 10 years on average, um, and can start earlier than you think in the early 40s for some people. Sometimes with all of these changes, people start to have new auras, as you could see in pregnancy with some of the estrogen changes then. Um, it's not totally unheard of at all to have new auras come about during this time. And I also commonly see that the attack timing can shift. So sometimes people start to have attacks that are more uh, early morning or they wake up and it's already severe. If the pattern change is significant, it's definitely worth thinking about a secondary cause. So somebody who tells you that headache wakes them up from sleep in the middle of the night, we take that usually as a red flag and we wonder whether they have a pressure problem. However, um, if we don't find secondary causes, often we end up thinking that there are, for reasons we don't understand, estrogen contributions to things like this attack timing. So what about hormone replacement therapy? This is actually different than contraceptive estrogen dosing because we're trying to physiologically replace the estrogen that the person does not make anymore. So even people who have aura often can safely use hormone replacement but it's worth using the lowest possible dose, not using a cycling kind of dose and not using an oral route if possible. The oral route we think has the highest stroke risk and highest risk of worsening migraine and aura. And if headaches and or auras are worse on hormone replacement, it's worth reducing the dose, switching to something that's non-oral, whether that's patch, vaginal, what have you, or if really you can't get anywhere, stop, because this probably just indicates that the person has an inherently elevated stroke risk. And the inherent risks of HRT, of course, should already always be weighed for a given patient. And if they have other risks and they have migraine with aura, then maybe that together might make you too concerned to suggest this. Fortunately, we do have some non-hormone options that could target both migraine and vasomotor symptoms that are not hormones. So things like gabapentin, which when we're using it for migraine, we often dose it once a night, two to three hours before bed, at which time it can help with falling and staying asleep and sometimes reduce some of those symptoms. Gabapentin does not have as good evidence for migraine prevention as some of the other ones that we use. However, it is in our uh, previous 2012 Canadian Headache Society guidelines, so it's worth considering. Or herbal GABA, the supplement version, and especially for patients who are not keen on a prescription medication, sometimes the herbal version ends up feeling more palatable and can still be quite helpful, albeit with less evidence. Benlafaxine, which does have reasonable studies for migraine prevention, can be used for migraine and vasomotor symptoms. And the doses that I've listed here are what we often use, which you'll note is a bit lower than if we were targeting mood primarily um, for the most part. So what about surgical menopause? And again, abrupt hormone change often worsens migraine and surgical menopause is nothing if not an abrupt hormone change. So this is not something that we usually suggest as a migraine treatment, although I certainly have people come and ask me if they should do this. Um, the studies actually suggest that most often migraine worsens after surgical menopause. Occasionally it will improve, but that's not as common. And so if you see somebody coming to you who is drastically worse after a hysterectomy, don't be surprised. So what do you expect after menopause? This is a huge question for a lot of women who have migraine. What's going to happen to me in the future? Um, because many people will hope that things will go away. So this may be the case, but it depends a bit on your migraine path. And so this is getting back to that idea from before, that the more headache you have, the more likely you are to have more headache. And so I tell my patients that their brain is walking the migraine path. And if they walk it more often, the path gets bigger. It's easier for your brain to find it next time. And if you start off going into menopause with a small path, you're not having attacks very often, you're more likely able to keep it a small path. If you let there be more time between your attacks, you let the plants grow, then you are more likely to do well. Versus if you get stuck with a migraine highway, it's much harder and takes longer to undo that and let things grow back again. So I'd just like to close with a couple of take-home points. Headache, especially migraine, is common and very disabling. 
And we usually follow a multimodal treatment approach with lifestyle factors, behavioral things, vitamins, acute treatment, keeping out of medication overuse headache and prevention. Hormone changes over the lifespan, as I think you have seen, can very significantly impact migraine and getting better control of migraine in perimenopause, so before things get terrible, gives you a much better chance of improving post-menopause. And probably still some missed here, but maybe a little bit less. Um, and so I thank you for your time. And I just want to make one plug for our first ever Canadian Headache Society Post to Post Conference that's being held in Toronto in October. Um, and I'm happy to have questions, whether in the chat or if you want to come on screen or what have you. Go ahead and unmute yourself if you wish to ask Dr. Sando a question. I'm not seeing anything in the chat or anyone unmuting. So I think you've done an excellent job. <laughs> You're also welcome to email me if there are questions that come up after this, but it, um, I appreciate getting to talk to you today. Okay. Thank you very much for coming and presenting to us. Uh, oh, one Thank you very much as well from the chat box. So it's my pleasure. Okay. Well, if that's it, I will let everybody go and we'll see you in the fall with our uh, rounds. <laughs>